Okay, so um, the uh, the old joke is, uh, uh, what should I do with runaway bleeding? Uh, first, take your own pulse, right? You probably have all heard that. Uh, there's some truth to that. Uh, you have to be able to compartmentalize and, and be like a uh, uh, be like an aviator with a checklist, right? Um, there's a few different settings when uh, you can encounter runaway bleeding, and, and I'll talk about each of these uh, quickly. One is uh, your anterior. Um, you're probably around uh, great vessels or down uh, low in the lumbosacral spine. You're around, lar around large vessels. Uh, two uh, is your posterior high in the, ne in, in the neck and uh, you're around the vertebral artery. Um, and then three, uh, uh, anterior bleeding from the back. Um, most common scenarios are, again, lower lumbar. And, uh, and then uh, kind of a separate cat subcategory of runaway bleeding is uh, the, the entire field is bleeding. So if you're in the front, the most common scenario is, uh, is an A-lift um, and uh, there's a, an immediate rush of, of blood and uh, that usually represents a large vessel injury. My, my recommendation is uh, put pressure on it and once you get uh, pressure on it, switch to a sponge stick, gives yourself a few seconds to start thinking about uh, what, what did we get, what did we do, what do we have to do. Start communicating immediately with your anesthesia team. Um, and, and then start to think through, okay, what do I need? Do I need help from a vascular surgeon because we just got the iliac, common iliac vein? Uh, do, uh, does, uh, do we have, uh, in my, organ, uh, my institution, we have a massive transfusion protocol because we're a, a trauma hospital. So, so I can say those words and they immediately push five units of type specific blood uh, without waiting. And, and 20 minutes later, if we don't call it off, they're gonna push another five units of type specific blood. Uh, uh, if, if your organization doesn't have that and you do operations where you might get massive bleeding, you might talk to someone about instituting uh, a protocol like that. And then, um, do, do we need other uh, visualization? Do we need to go to the IR suite for uh, uh, an agram or, or, and or uh, stent? Be thinking through that, talk through it with your colleagues. Um, if you have another colleague uh, who's nearby, uh, call them or call them into the room just so you have two people who are thinking through what do we do here while I'm holding a sponge stick on this, uh, on this vessel. In the second scenario, um, you're high in the posterior cervical spine. Uh, I think I might have just gotten the vertebral artery because it just bled a, a, a lot and, and I put pressure on it. I think I'm, I'm trying to at least slow it down. Um, uh, the most common scenario people used to talk about um, maybe tw 15, 20 years ago was in the, in, in the um, uh, using the Mogarol uh, C1, C2 transarticular screw. You would pull the drill out and, um, and there would be pulsatile bleeding, right? So the, the classic answer in those cases was uh, put in a short screw and, and, and you are now not going to the other side, right? Because you, you probably just damaged one vert, you're not gonna risk damaging the other, the other side. Uh, do we need to go to IR? Probably the answer is yes. Uh, do I have a vascular surgeon who uh, is willing to tackle trying to repair this? Uh, in which case you're gonna have to uh, unroof the vertebral artery but, uh, but if that answer is yes, then you may, may have that conversation with them. Um, the, the, uh, the next uh, scenario is um, anterior from posterior. And, um, and, and the most common scenario is someone's doing a, a T-lift, they're, they're being aggressive, they're ba getting, they, they have an adventure with their uh, curette, and uh, next thing you know, there's a lot of blood coming out of the disc space. And it's usually low pressure. It's usually in, uh, an iliac or, um, uh, or one of the branches off the iliac vein. Uh, and what I would tell you there is, and, I, and I've, I've reviewed legal cases on this, um, um, uh, do not wait for hypotension to tell you that uh, you, you just got uh, a bleeder in the front of the lumbar spine. If there's a lot of blood coming out, that's a sudden change. I would assume that's the that that's what's happened, um, because if you wait for hypotension, you're now late in the game, and you're probably not going to be able to catch up. Uh, I would again be communicating with your team, 
do we need to whip stitch the back closed uh, or just put a IO band over the back so we can roll them over um, and probably today take them to the IR suite uh, versus asking a vascular surgeon to go in into the retroperitoneum, find it and fix it. I, I can tell you that I've reviewed several cases, those patients mostly don't survive that, uh, that, that secondary plan of uh, I'm gonna call vascular and ask them to go find that, that vein tear. If they find it, it's on the back of the vein They've already lost a lot of blood into the retroperitoneum. Uh, you, you're probably in a much better situation if you can uh, take them to the IR suite and see if you can stent it. And then what about uh, the entire field? This is usually in the, the setting of uh, large posterior ex exposures. It's happened to me a few times when I got into uh, metastatic tumors from the back. Um, it's happened to me in, um, in a couple of really long posterior cases that I've seen it, uh, then we're probably talking about uh, consumptive coagulopathy, right? And, and that's a different animal. Um, today, at least in my hospital, we have uh, thrombin impregnated sponges, right? One, one of the outgrowths of um, uh, our military um, adventures in the Middle East uh, was, was the development of those um, thrombin uh, impregnated sponges. You can put them down and, and, and start to generate a clot in the entire field. You wanna call for red cells again, but now you also probably want to call for FFP, probably want to call for platelets because you probably have used these things up. Um, and, um, and again, um, I would consider closing. If you get them, get them stabilized, consider closing, even if you have to close over sponges and come back another day. And that's, that's totally okay. And that's, that's a, a very legitimate way of treating this. So overall, what I would say is this, you got to communicate. You got to communicate with anesthesia uh, at my institution about a decade ago. A, a, a young woman in a spine trauma uh, expired in the operating room on a Saturday uh, because the surgeons took way longer than they thought to operate her spine injuries. And um, and and there, when when we did the root cause analysis after the fact, uh, um, we said, why, why don't you? Um, you know, start transfusing them. They said, well, anesthesia didn't tell us they were, she was losing that much blood. Well, um, I'm afraid you're the surgeon uh, in charge of this operation. You need to be communicating with the whole team. You need to be thinking about not just where does the screw go, but how much blood have I lost? Um, and, and so uh, uh, make sure you stay tied in with the rest of the team. Don't let pathology delay sending red cells to your room. Some places they'll get on a high horse about well, we don't see a low hemoglobin, so we don't think it's, you know, it's, it's uh, appropriate to send you red cells. You tell them, I'm looking at the bleeding. We're not waiting for someone to draw it, send it to the lab, and uh, we'll talk about it later, but send the blood now. Um, and then again, I, I'll just remind you one more time, if you can get this controlled, um, it's okay to stop if the job's not done. You can stop, you can close them. In fact, one time as a fellow, I closed with a clamp over the, the side tear in an iliac vein um, because we, we couldn't get it controlled. We were able to get it controlled by, by putting a clamp on the side tear, closed the patient, came back two, three days later, much easier to, to repair. And, and so um, remember that's, that's always an option for you. That's all I have. Great stuff. <laughs> At the end of a long day, high energy, high information value. Thank you. I have a curveball question now. Of course, it's the Chapman curveball Shocker. question. Shocker. There are more and more ASC surgeries done, spine surgeries, and many instances, including our own federal government in this country, incents us to do these surgeries and ASCs, and uh, high-quality surgery can be very much delivered in a cost-efficient fashion. Mm -hmm. Let's assume the unthinkable, even experienced hand. You have, let's say, a discectomy, or I'm looking at Rick here because he published on this, an anterior discectomy fusion and a major bleed happens. Any thoughts on ASC location and how this alters your kind of a uh, triage protocol because there's no blood bank there? Yeah, right. So um, so I, it's a great question and, and the time to think about it is now. The time to think about it is before you book that case in your ASC or somebody else's ASC, uh, what do we do if? Um, when we open the, uh, the Orthopedic Institute at my university, it is literally 300 meters away from the main hospital, but it doesn't have a blood bank in it. And, and so we had to walk through each of these scenarios. Uh, what happens if, what happens if? Do we have a courier on call? Um, how, do, can we emergently transport the patient to IR, which is in a different building? Um, those are the kinds of things that you don't wanna be thinking about 
the first time it happens to you. You want to be having that those conversations before you book the case there. It's, it's kind of related, but one of the one of the philosophies or gestalts or or personalities of our hospital is not to transfuse because it looks bad on their their patient records, right? So I, I'm wondering, do you have a protocol in place for deformity or trauma surgery when you reach a certain amount of blood loss? It kicks in and the decision is over. Nobody can override it. That transfusion, fresh frozen is going to happen in an elective or civilized way rather than a crash and burn way. Yeah, so, so we don't. We don't. The short answer is no. Uh, we don't have a set amount of estimated blood loss uh, be before that, that kicks over. That's still left to the judgment of the surgeon. Now, you know, you and I both know, there's quite a bit of um, variability in estimating blood loss, right? The, the common uh, headbutting between anesthesia and the surgeon over how much blood is being lost. Um, but I would tell you, uh, another thing you can do is is uh, have the cells, if you're doing a larger case or there's a risk of uh, significant blood loss, have the cell saver in the room. Uh, they don't even have to open the disposables, but, but having everything in the room ready to go when you get into a tumor uh, can, can really make a big difference uh, to be able to uh, start uh, be, being able to uh, conserve some of the blood loss. I, and I do use the cell saver routinely, but what happens is in a six or an eight hour case, you'll get up over a liter and they'll say, oh, don't worry, we've given all the cell save blood back which, you know, 20 or 30% of it hemolyzes, it doesn't stick around forever, and then your blood starts to get liquidy and not clot. It, I, have, I think it would be really helpful if, if somebody could come up with guidelines for, for some kind of interaction. Yeah, it, it's, I, I agree with you, but, but it's su as you know, it's such a difficult thing. Like, we can measure uh, hemoglobins, which in, in these instances is probably still too slow for us to react to, um, but we totally cannot measure the consumption of, um, of clotting factors. Uh, and, and so you have to be, you're the person who's got your eyes in the field. You, you've got to be the one who raises that flag. And without taking Ted off the stage yet, uh, Rick, you did an exhaustive analysis of safety of outpatient anterior neck surgeries. And I know it was mainly done under the airway aspect, but uh, let's say you have the catastrophe of an arterial bleeding. Any specific thoughts in that setting as to what to do with that patient? Well, I think uh, what Dr. Choma said is, is you take your pulse. You, bleeding always stops with pressure on it. So you just need to understand where that bleeding is coming from, not compress the spinal cord uh, as you do that, especially vertebral artery is lateral to the canal. I mean, you got to get that in your mind, a lateral pressure with uh, you know, something to just, and then you, you take a deep breath, you let the anesthesiologist, number one, let the anesthesiologist know what's happening, and number two, get, get help. And in our, in our surgery center, I, I, will, I will tell you, it is the safest place to have a complication because at any one time, we have at least five spine surgeons and at least four anesthesiologists in our building, and we're connected to our hospital where we do have a blood bank. We, we do have a blood bank. We don't even have to go outside. So we, as Dr. Choma said, you think about all of these things. We even have IR guys that, that, that are right there around. We have the software on our C-arm, so we, they are comfortable doing whatever they need to do in our operating room to um, stop, bleep, find it, and, and, and stop it with, with their techniques. So actually, our surgery center is, is an incredibly safe place to, to have a, a spine problem. And one more thing, use of particulate matter when you have a vertebral artery injury, like gel foam, flow seal, stuff like that. Any thoughts on that, Ted? Yeah, so um, it, it, it sure is uh, tempting to do. It does come with additional risks, um, and, um, and I don't have any strong um, uh, advice. I, I think, number one, you got to stop the bleeding, and if you, if you need that, uh, you got to do that. Uh, I, I I know of at least I know of one case o over my career where I think that was a culprit in um, in in, in um, further injuring the patient. But uh, but I you know in the absence of other options right there and then, I think you got to stop the bleeding. Jens, uh, may I contribute? Do not use flow seal in a large arterial bleed. Mm. I, I have yeah. seen a, a, a horrible stroke. Yeah. Because of that, one of the surgeons in, in our facility got nervous, 
blew flow seal into a, a vertebrate injury and the patient stroked uh, a huge uh, yeah. c cerebellar stroke. Yeah, so there, there are, and that's a really good point, Rick, because um, for at least for some of our younger surgeons, that's all they see us use for hemostasis. And, um, and there's old timey stuff like Surgicil and, and, and other stuff that uh, hopefully they can blow the dust off the envelopes and, and open that out. And, I and totally let you use have that. to shout out my former chief resident who's here doing a vascular fellowship who taught me for vertebral artery. We had two cotton balls. If you've never tried it, take a cotton ball, stuff it in. It doesn't particulate, it doesn't embolize. And Leo, it's, it's magic, it, it'll save a life. Great comments. Thank you, Ted. Really cool stuff.